Amen, amen. Let's put our hands together one more time for Jesus. If today's your first time in a service, I encourage you to open up in this service and see what God has planned for you today. Um, I'm going to... I really felt today that I have a word for this church. When I was in prayer today before service, I felt it so strongly. I want to kind of rush right into this, but I want to give honor to uh, Pastor Torres and his wife. Um, such godly people of today is your first service and you're looking for a pastor. Don't wait till next year to get connected with them. Do it today. Get connected with them today and make this your home church. Amen. Give honor to my wife and my son and my daughter who's here with me that traveled all the way from Arkansas all the way up here. Um, I give honor to each and every one of you guys here today for your guys' uh, making it here on a Friday night. You could be anywhere else, but you decided to show up on a Friday night. You could be doing many other things, but today God brought you here and you decided to brush your teeth, put on your clothes, and come to the house of God. And when you decided to walk through those back doors of that building, God said, you know what, I got a plan. I got, a, I got an agenda for them today. Do you believe that here today? There's nothing better than giving your life 100% to God. 100%. Not 90%, not 80%, 100%. I, if, I could probably name times, or you could probably name times, you gave 100% for the devil. So I, I encourage you today to give 101% to God. I'm telling you, you leave everything on the altar. Come on, somebody. Turn me up a little bit more. Amen. You, you, gave, you gave everything to the devil. You gave everything. You poured out. You gave the money to the world. You, you spent money at the club. You slept around. But here today, on a Friday night, you have an opportunity to give God everything you, you can. Everything you can. Amen? Amen. Man, I'm already excited because I believe God's got a word for someone here today. Let's open up our Bibles really quick to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. And when you get there, say amen. And the Bible reads, it says, Looking carefully, lest any man fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this many become defiled. I like to preach for a short few moments on there's trouble in the wound. There is trouble in the wound. If we can lay down our Bibles all across this place and lift up our voices and pray in the Holy Ghost, I believe at the end of this service, walls are going to come down. There's going to be internal healings. God's going to heal the mind, the soul, and the spirit of somebody that walked in today that is wounded, that is under the sound of my voice. God is going to heal you today. I don't care if this is your first service, your last service. God's got a divine appointment with you here today. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Only if you're going to preach with me. Only if you're going to preach with me. Amen, amen. And I'm going to read this really quick. In 1881, there was a man named Charles Gateau. A man who had failed at everything he tried, and he tried everything. He tried law, and he failed. He tried, he felt a call to preach, and he failed at that. He tried evangelism, and it just didn't go well. And when he expected to become the prime minister of France, and when he didn't get what he demanded, Charles Gateau said he got a revelation or a message from God to assassinate the president. 
July 2nd, 1881, Charles Guiteau would do something that would affect America for the remaining years to come. He woke up one morning, got his suit on, got his shoes shined, and he says, I'm about to do something America's never seen before. The president arrived at a train station on July 2nd with his two boys. And Charles Guiteau would rise out of the dark shadows to shoot the president twice in the arm and one in the back. The shot in the back was not fatal, not hitting any vital organs, but the bullet was launched in the pancreas of the president. Uh, and within minutes, doctors covered on that fallen president, uh, using their fingers to poke and probe the open wound, uh, trying to find a bullet. Uh, to top everything off, the examination took place on a train station floor where millions of people had walked, leaving this area unsanitary. And for about 80 days, they began to poke and bruise and began to poke that wound to try to find a bullet. It is said that Garfield suffered severity of the pain as they dug in that wound to try to find a bullet. At this point, his body is riddled with infection. He has these type of masses all throughout his body. And as he's there starving to death, it is said the president weighed 210 pounds. By the end of the 80 days, he dropped down to 130 because the infection was slowly killing him. But they were persistent to find the bullet. It is said that part President Garfield finally died in September 19, 1881. And they did an autopsy on the President Garfield's body and they found that he would have lived if they would just have left the bullet alone and let him heal. But because of them not letting the wound heal, it infected his entire body. And they would go on to hang the man that shot the President. But his last words were this. I shot the president, but the doctors killed him. God sent me here to preach to somebody that you have been wounded by somebody else. And the wound in your spirit has begun to get poison into that wound and that wound has got poison in there in that wound I'm here to tell someone that hell is trying to defeat you from a wound that was caused by somebody else I'm here to tell you you need to hear this preacher today that the wound was sent for God to elevate you and to take you deeper into places with God. The Bible says that Satan is a thief. And that he cometh to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Hell's agenda is to kill, steal, and destroy. He's there to destroy your walk with God. He's there to steal the joy from your walk with God. I'm afraid at times we are doing more damage to ourselves when we hold grudges and unforgiveness in our hearts. And what happens is when we have unforgiveness, it holds us back in a prison uh, while other people run free. Uh, I'm speaking to somebody in your heart. You have bitterness uh, that is built up uh, and is stopping the move of God from working in your life. Uh, and the infection has gotten into your spirit. Uh, and it's caused, the, it, it has caused God to quit moving uh, in your life. And you're wondering why you can't feel God. Uh, I'm here to tell you, you must forgive them uh, of what they did to you. Uh, come on, somebody. In Hebrews 12 and 15, it says in the New Living Translation, it says to look after each other. So that none of you fails from the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. 
If you ever want to spot someone that is bitter in their spirit, uh, just sit with them across at a dinner table and watch the poison begin to spring out of their spirit. Uh, Every word will be words of slander and gossip, uh, trying to run somebody down. Come on, somebody. I'm I'm preaching to somebody in the Holy Ghost today. Uh, What is inside of a man will eventually come out uh, because the poison has gotten into their spirit. Uh, The poison has gotten into their heart. Uh, I'm here to tell you, you need to get the bitterness out of your spirit. Uh, You need to get the bitterness out of your life. Uh, In Hebrews 12 and 15, we're going to look at this again. Uh, That word defile. In the Webster, it's defined as this. It means to corrupt the purity or the perfection of something. And so what bitterness is sent to do, it's sent to defile, means to corrupt the purity of the person. Similar words to describe defile is to poison, to infect, or to destroy. And so I put it like this. Paul says, let any root of bitterness bring it up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. By the root of bitterness, many become poisoned. uh, Or or by the root of bitterness, many become infected. or, Or by the root of bitterness, many lose out on what God has because... What was sent to them was caused to destroy their walk with God. It was sent to corrupt their thinking and get poison in their spirit. I don't know who I'm preaching here today to, but I'm here to preach someone out of unforgiveness. I'm here to preach someone out of bitterness. I'm here to preach... I wonder what the wound was sent to produce in somebody's life here today. I'm here to tell you the wound was not to produce bitterness. The wound was not to produce produce hurt. But the wound was sent to produce elevation. It was to produce you to go deeper in your walk with God. And the Bible says... The root of bitterness, when springing up, calls trouble. You see, when bitterness is in your life, it will cause trouble. Oh, it will cause things to happen in your walk with God that you never thought would happen. It will cause trouble to enter your life where you, you just can't pray anymore because all you're thinking on is the problem of what someone did to you down Come on, somebody. It'll cause you to circle the offense all over again uh, until you now you can't pray. And now it's gotten launched into your spirit and it's infecting you. Uh, it's infecting your heart. Uh, but I'm here to tell someone we must talk, we must stand on guard against the spirit of bitterness that wants to make its way into a congregation, that wants to make its way into a revival and try to stop the move of God from happening in a city. The Bible said, blessed are they that have, that are pure in heart, for they shall seek God. The NIV in Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all, be careful what you think, because your thoughts will control your life. The devil wants you to get your mind to think about the hurt. He wants you to remember what they did to you when you were smaller. Or he maybe wants you to think about what the church previously did to you. And he wants you to get your mind on the hurt to where you're circling the offense over and over and over again till now you're replaying it in your mind. And now it's beginning to consume you and you can't let it go. I believe there will be more people in hell because of something they couldn't let go. And now they're in hell wishing they would love let it go, let the hurt go, let the offense go. But they took it to the grave. They took it to the grave. I'm here to tell you that God sent a preacher here today to tell you let go of the offense. Let go of the bitter heart. Let go. But hell's agenda 
is to keep the wound open so he can watch a child of God begin to self-destruct because of the bitterness that's so launched in somebody's life. I'm not telling you that you'll never be wounded in your life, but I'm telling you if you live for God, for no, no matter how long you're going to be hurt, you're going to get offended, you're going to be pushed out of the church somehow or someone's going to say something wrong uh, but you must not get bitter you must stay in the race uh, because God called you here as an ambassador of Christ when you get hurt hurt's not a bad thing when it's meant for the right reasons that hurt is supposed to elevate you to a place in God huh, that nothing else can. Huh. You see, if Joseph would have got bitter, he would have died in that dungeon. Huh. But he kept a right spirit. Huh. And little by little, God began to elevate him. Huh. And he said, wait a minute, I hear the king calling. Huh. Joseph shaved his face. Huh. God elevated him to the second in command over Egypt uh, because he kept a right spirit. Uh, he didn't get bitter. He didn't get hurt. Uh, but he allowed the hurt to elevate him in the spirit. Ephesians 6 and 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle. Our wrestling is not against our brothers and sisters uh, in the house of God. Our, our wrestling is not against the people out there, but there is a spiritual world that is alive uh, and is behind the offense. Uh, and it's there to cause confusion. It's there to get the left side fighting the right side uh, and get brothers and sisters fighting each other. For the Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But there are mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. In Psalms 23 and 4, he says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, it's a different translation, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are there to comfort me. He says, Even though I walk through the valley, Oftentimes when we're walking through a valley, we get a little discouraged at times and we want to sit down in the darkness. But God is telling someone here today, you must march through your darkness. David says, even though I walk through the shadows of the valley of death, I shall fear no evil. Your job as an ambassador of Christ or a saint of God is not to sit in your darkness. Your job is to walk. And when you begin to walk, you will see another hand that will begin to carry you through. Another hand that will begin to walk with you through. But if you're not careful, when you get in that darkness, uh, hell will begin to whisper in your ear uh, and says you're defeated. Uh, you might as well sit down. Uh, but he sent, God sent a preacher here to tell someone God's got a plan for your life today. Uh, I don't care what childhood trauma you've gone through. Uh, God's got a plan for you. Uh, he's got an agenda for your life. Uh, you may have been hurt when you were smaller, uh, and that was wrong, uh, but you must forgive them. Uh, you must forget that other, forgive that other minister who hurts you. Uh, you must forgive, uh, but you must see the real offender behind the attack. Uh, it wasn't your brother that wounded you in the house of God, uh, but there was a spirit behind it uh, that said, I'm going to try to defeat that brother. I'm going to try to discourage them. Uh, hoping they would self-destruct. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Look, at times they may be wrong of what they did. But we must set the three-inch tongue down called words huh, and quit driving words into people's backs huh, when they're not around. Huh. Sometimes I wonder if we did a spiritual autopsy in the church, huh, what would be the main cause of someone's death? 
I'm convinced it would be words where we drove in their back of people when they weren't around. We cut them to shreds all because of something we couldn't let go. All because of something they said. I know you were ready for a revival service, but I feel this in the spirit today. I, I feel there's some unforgiveness uh, and some bitterness that may have creeped into somebody's life. Uh, and hell's trying to defeat you. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that God has sent me here uh, to tell you that he has a plan uh, to release you from the unforgiveness. Uh, release you from the hurt. Uh, release you from the discouragement. Uh, release you from the bitterness. Uh, A man of God said this, he said, fornication has affected its thousands, but bitterness has affected its millions. Bitterness has taken more people out of the church than fornication. I remember in Fayetteville, Arkansas, preaching for a pastor. And, uh, and this, I'm thank God this is not happening here. Because we, you guys have an awesome, fervent, on fire pastor. But this, this guy, he was so wounded. And he was so in control and so hurt that bitterness crept in. And little by little, he began to, little by little, there was people leaving his congregation and leaving him. And the Spirit of God, you can tell, it just began to rip out of that place. And the people that left that were on fire were switched out with people that were hurt when you go in that place, it's so locked up, nobody's moving. Huh? Because everybody has a problem with everybody. Huh? But I'm here to tell someone it must not be that at Eastgate Church, huh? there must be a fire that begins to burn. And Come on, somebody. There must be a fire. There must be a fire started here today. Huh? That the fire says bitterness will not stay. Unforgiveness will not stay. There will be a fire at Eastgate. That will push unforgiveness out. And sometimes we don't even know that there's bitterness down in the surface because... Uh, it's a root that goes down, deep down underneath, and you can't see it until stuff starts sprouting uh, out of the top. Uh, and it starts sprouting through words, and it starts sprouting through actions. Uh, but the Bible says that vengeance is God. It's, it's not ours. It's not ours to take vengeance against somebody. But I can tell you this, that bitter, bitterness is after the joy in your walk with God. Because if he can take the joy that you have. You know that song. I got joy the world didn't give it to me. But you get that joy in the house of God. That's what hell is after. He's after that joy that will make you smile in the morning. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that for unforgiveness uh, will have you wake up in the morning and have regret. Uh, it will wake up, have you wake up in the morning and not want to read your Bible anymore. Uh, it will come and discourage you late at night. Uh, it will have you, it will take your prayer life. It will steal your prayer life. Uh, it will steal your walk with God. Hmm. here to tell, tell someone wounds don't kill people. It's bitterness. It is bitterness. Absalom's life is a portrait of the danger of bitterness. He chose not to deal with the hurt and pain of his past. Instead, he chose to allow the bitterness to destroy his life. Absalom had a sister who had been raped by his half-brother, Abnon, David's first son. And when this happened, word got back to Absalom that David did nothing about it. And the Bible records, for the sake of time, I won't go into this, 
but that Absalom hated Abnon for what he had done to his sister. And that hate began to sprout up in Absalom's life. And he said, you know what? I'm going to murder him. I'm going to kill him. The wound was open in Absalom's life. And he allowed a moment of pain and hurt to trouble him to the point where he murdered his brother. And later, later in the story, he led a rebellion against his father. One of the biggest rebellions in the Bible because of bitterness that got in, because of a hurt that he didn't let go. I believe God sent me here to tell someone to let it go. And if we can, if this is being recorded, let's, can we close this down? I, I, I want to share something here.